Um, my name is uh, Will Irving, uh, and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to this um, first in a series of webinars uh, being put on by the Royal College of Pathologists. The intention of this series of webinars is that they will be bite-sized, as it were. So um, we're aiming to, uh, we've invited speakers on a number of topics and we're asking them to speak for around about 15 minutes. And then we're hoping to have um, some interaction in terms of a question and answer session for another 15 minutes. So the whole event uh, is intended to be not much longer than half an hour. Um, there are 10 sessions planned in all. It would be nice to think that by the time we reach the 10th session in 10 weeks time, there won't be anyone online because we'll all be out in the street having street parties, but that may not be the case. So let's get on with it. And uh, the first uh, topic in trying to dissect what is a very complex pandemic um, seems to me to be the virus. Um, so tonight's talk is on uh, SARS coronavirus 2 and other coronaviruses. Um, and I'm delighted to welcome uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Chris Coleman, who is Assistant Professor in Infection Immunology uh, at the University of Nottingham. Chris has spent the last eight years or more working on the molecular biology, pathogenesis and treatment of highly pathogenic coronaviruses, uh, firstly in Baltimore in the United States and latterly in Leeds and now in Nottingham. I've um, had a quick chat with Chris this morning and I realized I've set him a very uh, difficult challenge. I suggested he might like to address the two big questions. Where do these viruses come from and why do they cause such severe disease? Um, and to do that in 15 minutes would be, would be very impressive, but uh, I'm confident he'll deliver. So uh, without further ado... Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Will, and thank you to the college for inviting me to give this talk. As I said, I'm going to talk about um, the virus that is SARS-CoV-2 um, and also on other coronaviruses because we do we don't know that much about the, the SARS-CoV-2 at the moment. And as Will said, I spent most of my time working on um, other highly pathogenic coronaviruses, uh, especially MERS coronavirus, when that was um, the big thing. So uh, coronaviruses have a distinct morphology by electron microscopy, and this is why they're named coronaviruses. So um, you can see a sort of crown of spike proteins around the, uh, the virus that gives it that distinctive look, uh, or like a crown, which can hence coronavirus. So coronaviruses are a diverse group of viruses. But they affect a wide range of species. They have human coronaviruses, they have pathogenic animal coronaviruses, which don't infect humans at all in most cases. And we have other animal coronaviruses of unknown pathology. So in terms of the human side of things, we have the less pathogenic human coronaviruses, of which there are four. And in most of these cases, in most cases, these viruses cause mild symptoms, like similar to a common cold, um, and have a very low death rate. Um, and then the highly pathogenic human coronaviruses are MERS and SARS-CoV-1, which have very severe symptoms and a high death rate relatively. So SARS had a uh, death rate of around 10%, MERS of about 35% but neither of them have spread very far and, and, or become pandemic. And then uh, in the animal coronaviruses, uh, there's a large group of bat coronaviruses uh, that are a potential source for many of these human coronaviruses. So as I said, SARS-CoV-2 has just emerged. Uh, it's not quite clear which group it fits into at the moment, except to say that it's gone pandemic. And obviously we've had to rename the original SARS now and put a one on the end of it, because this is SARS-CoV-2. Um, so this is the global spread of the original SARS and MERS. So they spread to many countries, but um, they both um, tended to be in the hotspot area. So the Middle East for MERS and the SARS was in China. Um, most of the cases outside of that, those regions were people who traveled to those regions and then returned home with the virus. And so the case was reported in that country, but there wasn't much human to human transmission in that country. The exception to that is uh, SARS in Canada, where there was a small outbreak. But in 2018, this was the reason why WHO declared them blueprint priority diseases, because of their potential to become pandemic, and there's no treatment or vaccine available for either of these viruses. And then, obviously, more recently, we've had the outbreak of the SARS-CoV-2, which has now spread all around the world. But virtually no, no country has no reported cases at this, this point. 
a slightly old data, but um, the, the latest map I could find, it just, but just basically shows every country now has cases uh, of varying, um, and this significant human, tra human transmission in each of these countries. So where do these viruses come from? Well, for SARS and MERS, um, in bats, we have, there are uh, imaginative names, SARS-like coronaviruses and MERS-like coronaviruses. And the, the current hypothesis is that these viruses recombine with each other and then infect to create new viruses that then infect an intermediate host. So for the original SARS, it was the civet cat was the most famous example, although it was other small mammals as well. And then for MERS, it is the dromedary camel. Uh, again, it, it does infect other camelids, but this is the main source of the virus. And in these hosts, these viruses cause mild disease, if any, uh, and, and have high transmission spread through those populations quite rapidly. Um, then the, through point mutation, these viruses mutate only slightly before they infect humans, where you get the severe disease um, that we see with these two viruses. So the main mutation happens from the bats to the intermediate hosts, and then the second line of mutation is only small between the human strains and the intermediate animal host strains. So for the new coronavirus, Obviously, we would expect we eventually will probably find some SARS-CoV-2 like coronaviruses in bats. Uh, there were reports that pangolins were the, the intermediate host for this virus, possibly others, um, and then that those from there have infected the humans. So, why are some coronaviruses more pathogenic than others? One of the theories is that it's when they evolved and, and when they first uh, transmitted into humans. So. This was a, a review study um, of the molecular clock analysis of when the, these different coronaviruses emerged. You can see all the less pathogenic human coronaviruses uh, were first reported in humans, or the, the, the clock suggests they, they jumped into humans you know, 50 to 100 years ago, whereas SARS and MERS were much more recent than that. Obviously, this doesn't include SARS-2 because it, it wasn't around at the time. Um, so it's possible that 100 years ago there was some kind of outbreak that nobody realized was anything in particular. Well, they weren't able to identify in particular anything, but now we'll be able to identify as the ancestor of 229E, perhaps. So, so my particular area of expertise is the molecular biology of uh, coronaviruses. So coronaviruses have a very long positive sense RNA genome of about 30 KB, which is very large for an RNA virus. This is just the MERS uh, genome, just, just as an example. So towards the five prime end, uh, these viruses have 16 non-structural pro proteins, uh, which are uh, translated as two large polyproteins, uh, and then cleaved up into the various bits. So and that includes the um, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase complex, which is shown there, which is a very complicated complex of lots of these proteins that copies the, the viral RNA uh, to make new genomes and uh, to uh, transcribe the genome. Uh, we have the structural proteins that make up the physical structure of the virion. Um, the nucleocapsid protein is inside and binds to the genome, keeps it inside the virion. The, and then in the membrane, there are three proteins, the most important of which is the spike protein, which is used for the entry of the virus. Uh, but there's also two, small, uh, two other small membrane proteins called E and M, uh, which have uh, unknown function, or maybe ion channels, for example. And then there's accessory proteins uh, in amongst those, uh, those, those structural proteins. And these are very variable between different coronaviruses. So different coronaviruses have different numbers of these proteins and also have different functions. There's no, uh, there's no way to say, you know, 4A protein is the same in all, in all coronaviruses as far as we know for now. So in my previous lab, for example, we cloned the genes from, all of the, from, from a lot of the proteins from MERS and transfected them into cells with the GFP tag. You can see that they localize in the cell in different ways. Um, so the non-structural proteins, the accessory proteins in particular, and put them in a table. We have some which are cell-wide expression, some which are only in the cytosol, because uh, you can see the, the shadows of the nucleus and other organelles, uh, so you know it's pretty much in the cytosol, and then others are localized to specific organelles. Um, and you can sort of attach um, a function to these proteins as well. So in red, it's just the RGRP components, and they're mostly cell-wide or in the cytosol. Uh, because that's where they are. And these are when they're expressed on their own. When they form, they, they would normally form a complex with each other and, and probably localized differently in the case of a real infection. And then the accessory proteins from the MERS we showed were inhibitors of innate immune signaling, and each of those has their own distinct uh, subcellular localization. Um, and one of the examples um, 
is P4B, which is localized to the nucleus. And we published on this one. So P4B uh, localizes to the nucleus. When you transfer it into the cells, you get very strong localization to the nucleus um, and it inhibits um, two innate immune signaling pathways um, based on the interferon beta promoter and the NF kappa B promoter. It's a luciferase reporter. So when the, when the pathway is active, you get luciferase signal when you have transfer it in the protein as well you get a block of the luciferase signal suggesting the pathway is blocked in some way. Uh, we were able to remove the nuclear localization sequence from P4B and uh, show that it wasn't required for that inhibition. Uh, later studies have shown that actually it um, prevents the translocation of NF-kappa B from the cytoplasm uh, to, the, to the nucleus. So the genome for SARS-CoV-2 has been solved and annotated again. So it has a very similar structure to, to the mers cov genome. So you have the two large polyproteins, one A and one B at the five prime end, uh, in blue there, the structural proteins in green. And then this particular virus has six uh, accessory proteins, uh, as we currently understand it. Um, uh, so uh, coronaviruses uh, have a very distinct uh, replication cycle as well. So this, again, this is just an example from MERS, but this is roughly the same for all coronaviruses. So uh, MERS, they bind to their receptor. In the case of MERS, that was a DPP4, or is DPP4, sorry. They, they enter the cell by endocytosis, a traffic through the cell uh, to a point in that pathway where they fuse, where the virus fuses with the, endos uh, the endosome membrane. Uh, then the genome is deposited into the cytoplasm and you get RNA transcription and, and replication. You get protein synthesis. Then the viruses assemble in the ER Golgi intermediary complex and then are exocytosed from the cell by the normal exocytosis pathway. And basically, the vesicles pop onto the surface and release the virus uh, from the cell. So, uh, we and others developed different methods to quantify the replication cycle of MERS that are rele basically relevant to other coronaviruses as well. So, you can quantify the entry pathway using pseudoviruses and pseudovirions. Uh, you can look for RNA replication specifically by RT-PCR. Um, you can do Western blot for proteins, and you can look at the uh, exocytosis and the release uh, of whole virions. So um, SARS-CoV-2 is a typical coronavirus structurally and genetically. Uh, it encodes structural, non-structural, and accessory proteins. And its replication is probably similar to other uh, coronaviruses. So why is this important that we understand this? Well, I just put this... This, uh, as the drug discovery uh, um, pathway from a novel compound to approval uh, and then use in the clinic. So it probably takes about 10 years, and that doesn't include a monitoring, long-term monitoring of the use to make sure that it's uh, A-OK -okay in the future. But of course, for coronaviruses, this is a bit too long. So SARS was eliminated from the uh, human population within about a year. Um, and it was no approved therapy or vaccination. It was simply by the effective quarantine of infected people and destruction of the animal intermediate, intermediate host. MERS is still ongoing, uh, seven years now, uh, still no therapy or vaccination for MERS. And SARS-CoV-2, of course, has just started, uh, uh, but it's nowhere near the 10-year the, uh, mark. So if we can understand how coronavirus proteins function and also the coronavirus replication cycle, or we can go and screen approved drugs, or we can design or screen novel drugs against those, um, those, those features of the virus replication. And then we can test them in uh, animal models or in humans. And of course, the one big question for us is, is there something that can be pan-coronavirus? Because when you look at the genomes of uh, coronaviruses, they are very similar. Um, so all coronaviruses have these, these non-structural proteins, and they have the structural proteins. Now, obviously, there is a lot of difference in certain structural proteins, like the spike protein, because that is the entry um, protein, and uh, each coronavirus uses a different entry receptor, or at least um, not all coronaviruses use the same entry receptor. So there is variation there. But a lot of these functions of these proteins are similar between coronaviruses. So can we target uh, common functions of these uh, proteins? and um, uh, develop pan-coronavirus uh, therapeutics in the future. We hope so. Uh, so that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, so, Chris, um, one question that's come through, and, and I have to say it occurred to me as well. This is from Isabella. 
is why is this virus called SARS-CoV-2 and why is it not just given a completely different name? It is, it is uh, so yeah, well this is one of those things that, um, so um, it, is it is fairly closely related for coronavirus to the original SARS. It uses the same receptor, which is uh, ACE2 or angiotensin converting enzyme 2 um, so, as the original SARS. Um, I'm not sure how genetically similar it is, but it is certainly within the same uh, group as that virus. So um, it's, it, I mean, you know, it, I wish they could have been more imaginative, but that's that's what they kind of came up with. So uh, that was the name. Okay. So in terms of the species of origin, how, um, what sort of evidence can be generated that proves that the species that transmitted it to humans was such and such? Well, the only way to do that really is to is to go and look for it in those species, and it does take some, and it can be difficult to pin it on a particular species, um, obviously, because especially in a complicated environment where there are lots of species interacting with each other, um, the it will be it will be you know, a case of them sampling lots of different animals to see if they're infectable or not with the virus and which ones. Um, come into contact with humans or each other more regularly than others and then genetically they will obviously look at uh, the viruses to, to see if um, how similar they are to each other and the ones that are most similar to the human one will be considered the, the most likely host. It's a bit complicated with coronaviruses because they don't seem to mutate as much as other RNA viruses. They have uh, RNA proofreading activity so you get the point mutations but you don't get a massive amount of mutation um, once at post um, recombination, which happens in bats because they they are co-infected with large numbers of um, coronaviruses at the same time. Um, but in the sort of intermediate host to humans, there's a relatively small amount of difference. Yeah, it's bad news for whichever species gets the label. Um, yeah, the civet cats came well out of the original SARS pandemic. Um, yeah, um, it was other small mammals as well, and it was, yeah, but it was, yeah, civet cats became the poster boy for that. Um, so I've had two questions relating to vaccine development. Uh, which part of the vaccine can be used, sorry, which part of the virus can be used to create a vaccine? So usually um, vaccines are created to the spike, we're using the spike protein because it's on the surface um, and uh, that's for neutralizing antibody responses. Um, there is um, discussion about using other proteins like the nuclear capsid protein to create uh, T cell responses, um, but it's mainly the spike protein uh, for neutralizing antibody vaccination. Uh, we were pretty successful in doing that for MERS um, and others have been as well, um, but uh, yeah. So spike usually. So do you see the vaccine coming as a subunit vaccine with the spike protein only or some kind of whole virus preparation? Uh, it will probably be a subunit vaccine. Um, there's, there's always a, 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 a bias against uh, using whole, whole vac uh, viruses um, because of the potential that they might cause an infection if, if they get it wrong. Um, at least in the modern sort of safety testing era, let's say. Um, so th there's that. Um, so it probably will be uh, a subunit vaccine and probably based on spike, like I said, although, so although uh, others may well um, try sort of spike and nuclear capsid, for example, to make both a neutralizing antibody response and a T cell response. So what, what's the stage of development of a MERS vaccine? Um, basically, uh, well, so basically it's not profitable to make a MERS vaccine because it hasn't gone pandemic and hasn't spread outside of that small region and the number of cases is small. So the when we tested a couple of vaccines. Uh, in fact, we tested a few drugs as well against MERS, uh, novel drugs. And every time we tested it, they said, thank you very much for doing that. We're not going to take it any further because uh, no government is going to stockpile this at the moment. So there's no point taking it any further. They were interested in it from the point of view of saying, this is a technology we can use to design a new drug against this random virus, essentially. Um, and so they're, they're trying to get uh, approval processes for the technology so that they can um, apply it to any virus in the future. Uh, but the actual MERS itself vaccination 
um, they were not interested. Um, we did, uh, with Thomas Jefferson University, we did a, a rabies MERS uh, dual vaccine, which uh, has progressed a little bit further uh, because it's a, an academic lab and also because the rabies vaccination component of it may itself be uh, a, a useful vaccine. Um, so that there will be interest in that as a vaccine for rabies, even if not for the MERS. But a MERS-specific vaccine, uh, yeah, unfortunately, um, as far as I'm aware, most, almost all of them have fallen by the wayside. It's certainly all the ones that we tested, yeah. and all the drugs we tested. Yeah. Um, so here's a different one. What is the molecular basis of SARS-CoV-2 causing such spread? Well, I suppose a related question is, is the spread of SARS-CoV-2 any greater than the spread of the other uh, human coronaviruses? Yeah, so um, certainly for MERS, the, the spread was very low in human-to-human -human transmission, except in very specific circumstances, like in a hospital setting where somebody was um, basically constantly exposed to somebody who had the virus, or um, if the infected person uh, was in contact with someone who had a... a um, a comorbidity that made them particularly susceptible um, to that to the virus infection. Um, so that's probably why MERS has not gone pandemic and it's not spread very far outside of the, the region that it, it is it's currently in. Um, the most the most transmission there happens from camels to humans. And so obviously, if you're not exposed to camels, then you don't get MERS basically. Um, so um, and as for the the new one, um, it obviously has a lot greater ability to spread, a much greater ability to spread uh, than, than MERS, certainly. Uh, SARS, the original SARS did spread quite well, um, but again, it, I suppose it was caught early enough um, and didn't spread as well enough, so it, it, uh, it, was, it was possible to quarantine people uh, really quickly with that one. Uh, it hasn't been possible with this. Um, I don't know about the molecular basis for why that is the case okay. at this stage. A related question, which I'm sure will have occurred to many people, is do we have any evidence that as we move into the summer and the temperature increases, that, that might reduce the spread? I don't know if it would reduce the spread. It might well reduce the symptoms of the virus infection. So I guess that's the normal, uh, I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm, that's not my area of expertise, but certainly, you know, um, respiratory infections are, have greater symptoms in the in the winter than in the summer because of the general weakness and cold air and all the rest of it that happened, the assault, long assaults that happen in the winter compared to the summer. Um, it may well be that it will spread, uh, but just not cause as many symptoms, uh, which is um, partly the, uh, and, it's just, and it's a similar thing with sort of asymptomatic individuals as to how, who is infected and when can you lift kind of quarantine measures and that kind of thing because um, you don't know who is everybody is if everybody is infected or not, and so as soon as you lift it, you might just release a lot of people that have the virus but don't realise it. Um, I th there's no evidence at the moment that it would be better in the in the summer than in the winter. Well, obviously, it's not really gone through. I suppose Australia uh, went through it in their summer, so and the, there was still significant disease observed. So. Um, you know, that's, uh, it depends how the virus evolves and, and what really happens during the summer when, when you've got such a large population in effect going through it at the same time, we had to get a good idea as to whether or not it is worse in the summer or not, or better in the summer or not. Okay, um, I'm getting a few questions on, on a slightly different topic, which is the immune response. And uh, we, we will be addressing the immune response in other yeah. um, webinars, but do you have anything to say about uh, does this virus affect the innate immune system in the same way as SARS? What's the basis of the cytokine storm that's probably at the root of the high mortality? Yeah, well, I think those are the things that are, are going to be discovered as, as time goes on more than a thousand. It, um, it's very likely that it um, has lots of inhibitors of uh, innate immunity um, because coronaviruses do. Uh, uh, and both SARS and MERS had a lot of inhibitors of innate immune signaling pathways. Um, so that's there's certainly that. Um, I don't know precisely about the details of the cytokine storm in this particular case, except that there is one. And, and that, that's usually uh, one of the pathological signs, uh, factors in particularly lung disease where gas exchange uh, requires you know, the, the 
the nice thin alveolar walls rather than massive cells uh, in there from an immune response. Okay, and, and there's a few questions on uh, drug targets. So the receptor is the ACE2, yeah. Yeah, um, is that going to be exploitable as a drug target? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the sort of thing that people will be looking into, uh, um, hopefully as I speak. Uh, it was a similar thing with uh, MERS, the DPP4 is, so DPP4 is involved in diabetes, so DPP4 inhibitors available for diabetics. Uh, so it's a similar um, thing. So, so they're going to they're going to be testing those, um, as I said, as I speak. And certainly things that are already approved um, are much have a much greater chance of success as long as you can get the approval from the company to use it in that way, um, because they've already gone through all the safety testing, or at least the basic safety testing um, in humans already. So they can be used at safe doses um, without any concern. Obviously, what dose is required for the virus? To, to kill the virus, is that still toxic or not? Or, or can the virus um, mutate to escape that particular drug more easily than another? Obviously, all those those are questions that um, will have to be answered uh, as time goes on. Okay, and and a related question is, if the if MERS and this virus actually use different receptors, is the implication that the drugs that were developed and tried in MERS may not actually uh, work against this virus as well? Um, it it depends. So we also say we really like we really like to to have pan coronavirus therapies that could work against SARS, MERS, this new virus, any coronavirus. So that if this would happen again, we could just say, oh, this drug is the thing to use. Um, obviously, anything that's very very specific for a specific virus um, would not be relevant. So, but and um, so yeah, DPP four inhibitors, for example, uh, would potentially work against MERS, but not against this. Um, so it's just, so it depends whether the drug targets, if it targets a very specific part of MERS, then it probably won't. Like if it targets something uh, cell based, so something, so for example, something in the endocytosis pathway um, that the, the virus, all coronaviruses use, then potentially it could be pan coronavirus or a common feature of um, different coronavirus proteins across coronaviruses. Okay, um, I'm tempted to ask how optimistic you feel that uh, drugs will emerge in the timeline that we actually need them. Um, I, I'm pretty, I mean, yeah, I mean, in the timeline we need them, what's the timeline we need them? I mean, it's, in theory, yeah, I mean, you know, if it was, if it's, if it's screening approved drugs and one of them works, I mean, the, the, for example, this talk of hydroxychloroquine or whatever, um, that's an approved drug. We know the side effects, we know the dosing. Uh, we don't know the dosing that might kill the virus, of course, but we do know the dose, the general usage of that drug. Um, so if that was, the, so if it was, if that worked, then obviously it, it could be very quick because there's no concerns about safety. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, uh, yeah, I don't know. Okay, I won't push you. Um, we, we're coming towards the end, but, but there are a couple of uh, uh, left wing, left, uh, left field questions here relating to origins of the virus, which you may or may not feel you want to address, but there's clearly some talk about, could this be an engineered virus? Uh, someone has mentioned that some association between this virus and BCG, I have to say I've not heard of that. Do you want to make any comments about that? Um, not really. I mean, the only comment to say is that people are working on this and that the people will find out where it came from. I mean, at this, at this time, it's, it's uh, unclear and it, it might find that there's a range of species that are infectable, for example, um, like pangolins was the, was the original one, but there could well be others. Um, so it's going to be complicated for a while until, until it's properly worked out. Um, that's probably the only thing I could say. Okay, I've um, been scrolling up and down uh, the questions I've received and fantastic, many thanks for sending these in. I think we've had about 19 different questions. Um, I've tried to paraphrase um, some of your questions to make them uh, sort of general. Um, it is 7.30. Uh, we did want this to be just a, a half hour session. Uh, I think maybe I'll draw the the discussions to a close there. Um, 
I do need to thank Chris very much indeed uh, for an excellent talk and for dealing with that me firing questions. It's unusual, you know, at a conference, the speaker gets one or two questions from the floor and, and that's it. Um, but we've had a steady stream uh, and you've, uh, you've done extremely well to deal with them off the cuff, as it were. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you found it uh, interesting and informative. I think that's everything I'm going to say, at which point I will close the meeting. Thank you. I can see some uh, rounds of applause. Very much appreciated. <laughs>